Forget it. <laughs> Again, here we go. We we got class. We have class until um, Tuesday till nine o five, right? Yes. Okay. Six o five. Who wants to come in? Joe. Six fifteen. Anybody? Six fifteen. No you can take a multiple. <laughs> you can take a multiple guess if you like. If you're if you're taking the multiple guess, you don't have to speak up. I just need a time for an oral. Okay. Uh, six thirty. Anybody? Anybody? Connie. Connie. Six forty-five. Do I hear six forty-five? <clears throat> Seven. 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 Seven fifteen. Who? <laughs> I can't hear you. Bueller. Oh, Bueller. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, everybody else is going to take the multiple guess? No. I just want to really late with time. No, that's not how it's gonna, it works. Once we're in the class time, whatever times don't fill up, I give you. All right. I'll so, take both the 6.45 and the 7. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Did I spell Scarlet? Is there two T's in Scarlet? Seven thirty. Okay. How do you spell your first name? E L I. E L I. Elisa, right? Is that right? Did I say it right? That. <laughs> I like that. Seven forty-five. Who, who, who's left? Anybody else? A everybody else is going to take the multiple guess? Chris is coming at 7. Anybody else we're missing? Uh, who is that? Caleb. Uh, 8.15. Uh, say yeah. Everybody else come at, um, you know what, Joe, I'm going to make you at, um, can you guys come at 6? Or is that a problem? You'll just have a few minutes, Joe. Yeah, no. yeah, that's fine. I'll get those set up for the multiple guests. You got me? So you come in, everyone who's taking the multiple guests, you start at 6.05. You got me? We start at 6.05, right? If you're late, you don't get a test. I'm busy. You got me? Nothing I can do about it. Yeah. Yeah. In the, okay. What? In the room? Oh, were you doing it? No. Oh. Oh, that's what I was thinking like that. Oh, I gotta I gotta talk to uh no. hang on. <laughs> Somebody gotta remind me to talk to Nancy. She can proctor the guys that are taking the the multiple guests. All right. What Say, if you go over time? I kick you out. Okay. Yeah. I just say time's up. All right. And go home. All right. Hang on. Something's really messing up. Okay. Everybody's got their time? Say yeah. Uh, you know, uh, yes. Uh, the, you said the questions are going to be written out, like in no cards, you said? No. No? Pull a card. No. I'm going to explain it right now. Printed out all the questions on the midterm. 
you will have a stack of playing cards with pictures of a kidney on it. Okay? You're going to shuffle them up however you shuffle. If you want to do the bridge, you can do the bridge. <laughs> if you want to. No, no extra credit for the bridge. Then you're going to pick three cards. You can pick one at a time if you like, or you can pick all three. You got me? There's an opportunity for a joker in there. If you pick a joker, you can choose any question you like. You answer them, and I give you your grade right on the spot. Any questions about that? There's only one joker in the deck? I don't want to talk about that. Okay. okay. Again, why do I do that? Any other questions? None, right? None. Good. Wait, I gotta save this? That's what I get. That's what I get. That's what I get. Okay. How many questions are on the final? On the written one? On the final? Yeah. I mean, on the multiple tests. On the multiple tests. I don't even know. I haven't even looked at it. I haven't even looked at it. I There's like. 105. I think there's like 68 or something like that. It's a big one. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Uh, what, what is this? Spring weights. Yeah, it's the spring semester, right? Yes. Is it? Yeah. Boy, I hope that saved it. should not be this hard. Ah, it saved it. It's all my fault. Okay, no questions. I am going to rip through this. I won't even take a breath. I'm not even, and we're talking about the respiratory system. <laughs> all right, no extra credit. There's no extra credit on the respiratory slash kidney quiz. None. None. No huh? No Kahoot. We ain't got time for Kahootin. Hang on. Yeah. Here we go. I explained to you why we breathe, right? Now I'm going to explain to you how we breathe. First of all, Write this down, never forget it until the class is over. Then completely forget it. All right, here we go. We know that the lungs, the outer lining of the lungs, you have a lining that covers the lungs directly called the parietal pleura. And then you have another lining that lines the inside of the rib cage, a thick, tough lining called the uh, parietal pleura. Did I say parietal pleura yeah. twice? Mm -hmm. All right. See, I'm all confused now. <laughs> <laughs> Visceral pleura covers the lungs directly. The parietal pleura covers the inside of the rib cage. Listen up because this is true. The visceral and parietal pleura of both lungs are separate. Let me explain. Not very long. Here we go. Son of a... Watch. You've got a visceral pleura. Hang on. Then you have the parietal pleura of the right lung. Watch it. Watch it. I'm going to make this these different colors. Is that a different color? 
No. So what? <laughs> you just have to know it. The parietal pleura and the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura of both lungs are separate. Do you understand that? Yes. The parietal pleura of both lungs are directly connected to the diaphragm. The parietal pleura of both lungs are directly connected to the diaphragm. Uh oh, here's some chemistry coming at you. Boyle's law. Boyle's law states that if you increase the volume of your lungs, that will lead to a corresponding decrease in the pressure in the thoracic cavity. Watch it. In its relaxed state, the diaphragm is dome shaped. When the diaphragm contracts, it flattens out. What's connected to the diaphragm? Don't even tell. I'll just tell you. The parietal pleura of both lungs. So when the diaphragm contracts, it will pull the parietal pleura down and it will elongate the lungs. And as the process of elongating the lungs, what happens to the pressure inside the lungs? It decreases. And now atmospheric pressure becomes greater than the pressure inside the lungs and air goes from high to low. That's how we breathe. We breathe by changes in pressure. Watch, I don't have one here, but if you look at a, at a uh, skeleton, the ribs kind of go down at an angle, right? They're not straight across. So when you take a breath in, a deep, big, deep breath, right, like that, the ribs actually raise up, and that increases the anterior-posterior diameter of the chest. So anytime that you're exercising, you've got to get more air into your lungs, you're going to use the accessory muscles of ventilation, which include the intercostal muscles, sternocleidal mastoid <laughs> muscle. Those will raise the rib cage and increase the anterior-posterior diameter of the chest, increasing your lung volume. So at rest, if someone's using the accessory muscles of ventilation, they're in trouble. Say yes. Okay, here we go. You are recording, right? Just, uh, <laughs> oh, I don't think I am. Oh, yeah, I am. Oh, here, watch. Watch. And believe it or not, I hate to say this, but everything I'm telling you right now, Is it in the it's in your book. Ugh! That evil probably wonder why there's a bucket there. <laughs> I'm wondering too. Watch. That's how the ribs lay. If you lift the handle of the bucket up, the handle moves away from the bucket. So that's how you increase the anterior posterior diameter of your chest. Because the lungs are at an angle. So yeah. Okay. All right. Here we go. Want this whole thing. Your spinal cord is protected by your vertebral column, soft tissue. What's part of your brain that controls breathing? Don't even tell me. I will tell you. It is the medulla. You got me? Medulla is in the brain stem. So as CO2 builds up in the arterial blood, that CO2 is going to um, diffuse into the cerebral spinal fluid. It's going to combine with water and form carbonic acid. Say yeah. yeah. Okay. Carbonic acid then dissociates into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions. Whee! And it is the direct stimulation of chemoreceptors within the medulla that will stimulate the medulla to produce action potentials. Those action potentials will then that are produced in the medulla travel down the spinal cord. The nerves that innervate the diaphragm are the phrenic nerve. The phrenic nerve exits the spinal cord between cervical vertebrae three and cervical vertebrae number five that directly innervate the diaphragm. The diaphragm has a left and right phrenic nerve. So as CO2 indirectly builds up directly the stimulation of hydrogen ions, that will stimulate the medulla. The electrical impulse will travel down the spinal cord. It will then exit 
the phrenic nerve between cervical vertebrae number three and cervical vertebrae number five. That will stimulate the diaphragm to contract. When the diaphragm contracts, it flattens out. Because the parietal pleura is directly connected to the diaphragm, as the diaphragm contracts, it's going to pull the lungs down, elongating the lungs, decreasing the pressure because you're increasing the volume within the lungs. That's how and why we breathe, Mrs. Wildley. Say yeah. It's right there, and I did that in like two minutes. I'm killing it tonight. All right. Okay, watch it. Normally, through normal inspiration, non-pathological respiratory disease, the primary stimulus for breathing is the buildup of hydrogen ions and cerebral spinal fluid indirectly related to the buildup of CO2 in the arterial blood. Do you follow that? Doesn't matter, I'm keeping going anyways. Here we go. However, there are some conditions that will warrant that you don't breathe because of the buildup of CO2. That is why the arterial portion of the cardiovascular system has these peripheral chemoreceptors. These peripheral chemoreceptors are called carotid and aortic bodies. These peripheral chemoreceptors are specifically sensitive to elevated PCO2, decreased PO2, and a drop in pH. That's another way of saying increased hydrogen ions. Tell me you got that. Watch. Let me give you an example. We do not breathe due to lack of oxygen. We breathe due to the buildup of carbon dioxide. Watch. And I, you, pro I'm, you probably are hoping this happens. I'm sitting here in class. And then I am somehow teleported to the top of Mount Everest. Right? I'd be cold. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Watch. If I'm sitting here, you got me? I'm making a certain amount of carbon dioxide. That's going to determine my breathing rate. Say yes. If I go up to Mount Everest, what's going to happen to the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere? So, the less oxygen that's in the blood, that is going to be picked up by peripheral chemoreceptors. Who's following me? And those peripheral chemoreceptors are then going to feed that low oxygen level in the blood back to my buddy, the medulla. Are you, got, are you with me? And that will cause me to breathe faster and deeper. But am I making any more CO2 than I was sitting here at sea level? No. So if I'm blowing off more CO2 than I should, what's going to happen to the pH of my blood? That was the other choice, right? <laughs> your pH is going to go up because you're blowing off more acid. That's what produces altitude sickness. Say yes. When we get into chronic bronchitis, I'm going to explain to you where uh, peripheral chemoreceptors become involved. And it's very important that you understand that concept. Just so you know, the medulla, you cannot look at the medulla directly. You have to look at it through a mirror. Because if you look at it directly, you will turn to stone. Joe? Have you ever looked in the medulla directly? I might have. <laughs> that ain't right. How many people followed that? What's the primary stimulus for breathing? The buildup of hydrogen and uh, uh, yeah, yeah, right. And indirectly, it's the buildup of carbon dioxide in arterial blood. Say yes. Okay. Now watch. Watch. Have you ever wanted the G.I. Joe with the Kung Fu grip? Colleen, did you? Nope. Yeah. 
How about the Malibu Barbie with the pink Corvette? How about the Easy Bake Oven? You ever tr you ever try this like the cakes? It's a freaking sixty degree watt bulb that makes the cake. Anyways, if you have a kid who's spoiled like I do, and they don't get what they want and they hold their breath, is that bad? No. Can you override the effects of the medulla? Can you hold your breath if you wanted to? Right, so you can control your breathing to some degree, right? But if you're going to hold your breath and say, Tim, I want an easy multiple choice midterm, or I'm going <laughs> to hold my breath. I was like, go ahead. See if I care. Right? So you're going to take a big deep breath and you're going to hold it. So you're building up CO2. Tell me you got that. And there's going to be a point where the medulla says, you're a dumbass, and I'm going to start making you breathe. Do you understand? Now watch, if you're underwater, do you want to breathe? No. no. But if you're underwater, when you build up that CO2 to a particular level that you can't override anymore, you are forced to breathe. And when you're underwater, you will breathe in water. That's how they know you drowned. Watch, dead people don't breathe. Are you writing that down? So because dead people don't breathe, when they've they find them in a lake and they don't find any water in their lungs. They know that they didn't drown. They were killed someplace else and thrown in the lake. Now, if they were smart, what they would do is put that person under the water, do some chest compressions to mimic breathing. Okay, so when people decide they're going to hold their breath and they take the big deep breath, does it actually do anything? The big deep breath? Yeah. No. You don't breathe because of lack of oxygen. You got plenty. You breathe yeah. because of carbon dioxide. That's why I watch these pearl divers that they can hold their breath for five minutes. You know what they do before they go under? <gasps> they hyperventilate to blow off more CO2, so it takes longer for the CO2 to build up before they have to take a breath. Yeah, see all the stuff you learn in this class? If you kill somebody, right, how to get water in their lungs. <laughs> How do you do what? All right, you're getting off the subject. I was doing really good. Tell me you got that. Mm -hmm. Peripheral chemoreceptors say yeah. Okay, watch. They're particularly sensitive to drops in pH. Mm. 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 Come on. I need a new pen. Can I tell you the story real quick? Real quick? Uh, can I or no? Yeah. I forget it. I saw Sarah. She, did, she wanted no part or no story. Okay, here we go. If you can tell me what I'm going over, I'll give you extra credit next semester. <laughs> What am I going over? No. If your blood sugar is 1,214, do you have insulin? No. If you don't have insulin, can you get glucose from the blood into the cells? No. No. What does your liver cell think? You're an idiot, yeah? The liver cell thinks you're starving because the liver is not getting any glucose. So the liver cell thinks that you don't have any glucose in your blood. Tell me you got this. Who's following this, right? So when the liver thinks you're starving, the liver knows that the only fuel the brain can use is glucose. Ain't that right? So if you ain't got no glucose, the liver starts taking fat and making what? How soon we forget.
I got a good chuckle on some of you trying to remember the, the acids for ketoacidosis. Yeah, acetate and cinna, huh? Yeah, acetone. Yeah, that'll help you in clinical. And aceto acetic acid. What are those? Come on. For real? They're the ketones. Say yeah. And those are going to get dumped into the blood. Say yes. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen to the pH of your blood? <clears throat> what are peripheral chemoreceptors stimulated by? So as the hydrogen ions build up in the blood due to ketoacidosis, what happens to the rate of breathing? That's why you get the coo small breathing. Say, yeah. Uh, I just answered a question on the respiratory quiz. Killed it, too. Say, yeah. Uh, okay, here we go. Can you blow out all the air in your lungs? No. Let's try it. Come on. Bella, go ahead. No. Just try it. I don't want to. Colleen, try it. Vicki, will you try it? What are you eating? Oh. Uh, what were you eating? Cuties. A lot of eating going on here. What kind of pizza are you having? None of your beeswax. Sassy. Here we go. Watch. <coughs> Can you blow out all the air in your lungs? No. That's good. Good. Why can't you blow out all the air in your lungs? Because your body won't you be stupid. No, that's not right, but that's good. You could have said that. You could have worked that, right? I could have been like, yeah, right. And they were like, oh, yeah, okay. We're getting on board with that. Better write this down, better not pout. Between the parietal and visceral pleura, there is a pleural space. There is actually negative pressure. There's like a little vacuum in there. Tell me you got that. And that little vacuum prevents you from blowing out all the air in your lungs. Tell me you got that. Now, real quick, the lining, these linings are serous membranes. Serous membranes secrete a lubricant. So when you breathe, the parietal and visceral pleura will rub against one another. Say yes. But because of that lubrication, it prevents friction. Tell me you got that. Now, how many people here smoke crack? <laughs> Daily. Daily? Good. How anybody uh, do? How do you do math? Do you smoke math? I don't even know. I should know that. Math was not a big thing back then. When I was like, uh, crack was coming out when I was working in the emergency room. What do you do with math? Anybody know? I'm not judging. Do you smoke it? Okay. Oh, you do smoke it. I, you know how I know? You gotta cook it. What else you gotta do? <laughs> you gotta cook it and then flip it every. <laughs> now you gotta let it cool. <laughs> then go away and do the dishes. <laughs> Your next meth meth batch. You can always tell when someone smoked meth. Their teeth get bad. Their teeth get bad because watch when you smoke meth, it's a sympathomimetic. It mimics the sympathetic nervous system. Watch it. And it will, what does epinephrine do to blood vessels? So you cut off blood flow of your gums, your gums rot, and then your teeth rot off. Ew. Nice. So, yeah. Okay. You know, we should, we should try that. <laughs> Root back to you. Watch. People who smoke meth or a crack, the lubrication dries up in their lungs and also around their heart. So a lot of these people come in with pericarditis or pleurisy. 
pleuric chest pain. And just real quick, clinically speaking, if you're doing triage in an emergency room, what's triage? Where you triage. <laughs> triage is where you determine the most seriously injured people or sick people and decide, okay, you get seen first, right? So if someone comes in and they're having chest pain, one of the ways to determine whether or not they should be seen first or they can wait is ask them, take a big deep breath. Does it hurt more or less or the same? If it hurts more, it's almost always chest wall pain or, or pleuric chest pain, and those people can wait. That's why a doctor, when you examine someone for chest pain, they'll take their hand and put it on their sternum and push on it and say, does that hurt? Does that hurt more, make the pain worse? If it doesn't, then it may be cardiac related. Tell me you got that. All right, how many holes you breathe out of? Three, that's right. Two nostrils and a mouth, say yeah. Okay, what kind of pressure is in the pleural cavity? Negative, it's a vacuum, right? It's a small amount, right? But that's what prevents our lungs from collapsing. Now let's say for example, and this would be hard for me to believe, if someone didn't like you and they took a knife and they stabbed it in your chest, you got me? And then they pulled it out. How many holes would you breathe out of then? Well, we just added one more hole, Joe, so you did the math in your head and that's very good. So we breathe out of three, now someone made another hole in you and now you breathe out of four. Okay, now watch. Try this. Try this. Try this at home. <laughs> Not stabbing people. Watch. Put your fingers on your two ribs. Take a breath. And what happens to the distance between your ribs? It gets bigger, right? So watch. When someone has a open chest wound, it's called a sucking chest wound. All chest wounds suck. <laughs> so watch. If somebody takes a knife, stabs you, pulls it out, wipes the blood off, and then ambulates home, when you take a breath in, the distance between the ribs increases. So it will open up that hole and air will get sucked into the pleural cavity. What happens to the distance between the ribs when you blow the breath out? It gets smaller, so the hole gets closed off. So every time this person takes a breath, air is going to get trapped in that pleural space, and it will begin to crush the lung. So every time they take a every breath they take, I'm watching you. Every time that they take the breath in, that air will build up in the pleural cavity and it can't get out. Do you understand that? That's called a tension pneumothorax and it is life threatening. That's why if you see somebody and they got stabbed with a knife and the knife's still in, do you pull the knife out? Watch. Here's why you don't. Do you know why you don't? Pull the knife out and then put your finger in it. Watch. How many people cut bread like this? You cut bread like this. The knife cuts both ways. So when it goes in and when it comes out. And if that person is still alive and you happen to pull it out and you sever a big old freaking artery, then you just kill them. So you take a little juicy fruit wrap it around the knife, and you get them, you ambulate them to the ambulance. <laughs> now watch. If the knife is gone, then stick your finger in there, and then just have them walk. Have the, put their finger in there. Here, buddy. <laughs> Let's go. You got that? Yeah. Is, is that a real suggestion, or is that... I know. <laughs> <laughs> watch the best thing to do is to cover up the hole 
if I had time, I can show you how to make a homemade one-way air flap for someone uh, with a tension pneumothorax. I don't have time, though. But, no, what you want to do is you want to cover up... No, you want to cover up that hole. You do because you, every time they take a breath in, the air getting trapped in the pleural cavity, that is what is bad for them. Tell me you got that. So here's dude. Watch. X-rays are really good at looking at solid material. That's why they're really good for bones. Bones are solid. If x-rays are not absorbed, they show up as black on an x-ray. Is air dense? Do you have to? No. <laughs> the air is real dense. No. So it's going to show up as black. So the, this, this dude's heart, right? So this is what's left of his right lung. So he got stabbed. You got me? Somebody pulled it out. And then they were nice enough to actually mark the hole and show the air going in. So this guy's got a severe tension pneumothorax. Look what's happening. This is the endotracheal tube. His trachea is supposed to be over here. So all of this air, and his heart's getting pushed over, and this is what's left of his left lung. So all of this is air trapped in his lungs, and it's pushing, and it's crushing his heart. And when you crush the heart with air, and the heart can't fill, it's called cardiac tamponade. Cardiac tamponade is what's really, really the killer for people with attention pneumothorax. Have you heard of cardiac tamponade? Yeah, in ER they talk about it all the time. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, we'll big one. <laughs> Watch. This is a chest tube that they put in. And how you fix attention pneumothorax is you cover up the frickin' hole, then you put a chest tube to suction, and you vacuum out that air. Then every day or so, you get a chest x-ray to make sure that that lung is reinflated. Tell me you got that. So is that like a, a collapsed lung? That's a collapsed lung. But, but this is worse than a collapsed lung because it is air is getting sucked in. There are people who suffer with what's called spontaneous pneumothorax, where the parietal pleura will actually rip away from the uh, wall, the chest wall, and it will begin to compress the lung. That's a spontane that's not life threatening. It can be, but not like a tension thorax where you are keep building up pressure in there. Because there's no hole in the chest in a spontaneous pneumothorax. It's just a collapsed lung and but they have to do the same thing, chest tube deception. So if it tears away from the wall, is that like a hereditary thing? It can be, like people with uh, autoimmune conditions like sarcoidosis, uh, they can get uh, spontaneous pneumothorax. People who've done uh, underwater diving, mm -hmm. they can get, uh, because of uh, the bends, they, yes. So it's usually, uh, um, it's usually some type of condition. You, you shouldn't be, you know, I, hey, I went to Kohl's today and as I was looking at blue jeans, I got a spontaneous pneumothorax, right? It shouldn't happen like that. Let me show you this. I have to do my due diligence <coughs> most days. Come on, you. What the? I can't even see. And it's always good that I make the font really small. That really makes a lot of sense. I'm changing my picture too, to when I was like 24. I had hair, everything, styling. Okay, this is in, uh, did I show you this? This is in Russian, so I'm gonna interpret for you. This is what they do, this is a, um, this is called a needle decompression of a tension pneumothorax. Basically what they do is they put a needle into the thoracic cavity and it has a one-way valve. It will let air out, but it won't let air in. Observe. And you'll actually see the lung inflating.
So, and this is a big freaking needle too. It's like a big pen. That's the needle to get through the tissue. Then they pull the needle out because that's metal. And then as the guy is breathing, the air is being removed by that one-way valve and you can see the lung inflating. You can see how moist and meaty is in there. You can see the thin visceral pleura and then you can see the tougher lining inside the parietal pleura. But they have to make sure it stays inflated. What's that? Uh, that's plastic. That's why they take the needle out. Watch, it'll bend. It, it'll bend. Watch. See how, and see the lung juice coming out? That's the serous membrane. Isn't that nice? They had some groovy tunes on there too. So that is a, that's a, um, a needle aspiration of a um, tension pneumothorax. Yeah, those are life threatening. Tell me you got that. And the treatment for that is needle aspiration. Then once the lung is inflated, it's chest tube to suction. And then you have to keep that chest tube in for about three days to make sure that the lung is fully inflated. And then they are officially straight. So yeah, uh, one thing I'd like to point out too, if you've ever read an x-ray, you look right here, uh, this is a turd. <laughs> Do you know that? <laughs> so, this guy, he probably got a tension pneumothorax, right? He's probably sitting there on the, on the crapper, <laughs> uh, and then boom, he's a blue one. Blue attention pneumothorax. <laughs> okay. Tell me you got that, guys. Okay, here we go. All right, I'm going to explain to you right now how oxygen and carbon dioxide are transported in the blood. I want this whole thing. All right, Bella, if you get this right, April will take you to the Moose Lodge and buy a chicken burrito. Whatever. Ready? Can you dissolve a gas in a liquid? No. Joe, can you? Yes. Yeah, you can. You can. Right? Okay, get this right. What's this? Well, what's the number? <laughs> what what is that? Does that number mean anything to you? Fifteen weeks of a chemistry class. And that doesn't mean anything to you. It's one atmosphere. That's the pressure that the atmosphere exerts on you at sea level. You know that. You got me? Okay. You learned the gas laws in chemistry. Do you remember that? Does anyone, and I am totally spitballing here. Yes. What's Dalton's law? If one thing goes up, the other thing goes up. Okay. Yep, that's not right. Uh, Dalton's law is uh, the law of partial pressures. Let me explain it to you. Dalton's law of partial pressure states that if you have a mixture of gases, that total mixture of gas exerts a pressure. Okay? So the total pressure of a mixture of gases is equal to the sum of each partial pressure of that gas mixture. Can I explain that to you? Because that didn't make any sense, did it? Okay, here we go. The total atmosphere pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. Tell me you got that. What's air made out of? 
That's right. That came out of you like a battleship. Really? Right here. Damn. Where was that? Is that in a video someplace? Uh, no, it was in one of your other ones that you don't talk in. <laughs> <laughs> Those are good videos. Those are the old time movies, the silent movies. <laughs> Those are the best. Here we go. So watch. Air is made of nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon dioxide. Nitrogen, when it's referred to the respiratory system, is like many of the students in my class. Their nitrogen in the respiratory system is inert. It, the amount of nitrogen you breathe in is equal to the amount of nitrogen you breathe out. All nitrogen does in the atmosphere for you is take up space. Tell me you got that. Oxygen is 21% and carbon dioxide is 0.03%. So it is negligible. Okay, now watch, watch. What did Dalton's Law say? I'll tell you. It said that the total pressure of a mixture of gases is equal to the sum of each partial pressure in that gas mixture. So what is air mostly made out of? What's 79% of 760? Stop me. I'm doing the math for you. So the partial pressure of nitrogen in the atmosphere is 600 millimeters of mercury. What's the partial pressure of oxygen? Well, I'm going to do that for you. 160 millimeters of mercury. Are you with me? And then the PCO2 is zero. So if you add up 600 and 160, you get 760. Say yeah. Okay, I'm going to simplify it even further. Bella, can you dissolve a gas in a liquid? What is the blood mostly made out of? Water. This is advanced. I need a little more advanced answer. Guys. <laughs> That's more advanced. <laughs> Right, 0.9% sodium chloride, normal saline. Oh yeah. oh, yeah, yeah, forget about that one. Here we go. Ready? So, watch. If you dissolve oxygen in plasma, what's plasma mostly made out of? Just read it. There you go, 0.9% sodium chloride. Oxygen dissolved in the plasma is measured as a PO2. Can you transport oxygen dissolved in the plasma? Yes. Yes. And how is it measured? Just right. And P, what does PO2 stand for? It's the partial pressure of oxygen in plasma or in air right tell me you got that and it's abbreviated p o 2 have you ever seen that on a sheet a lab sheet p o 2 have you ever seen that no well go look you'll see it can you transport carbon dioxide dissolved in the plasma mm -hmm. so carbon dioxide dissolved in plasma Guess what that is? Oh. Oh. That's good. That's called PCO2. So the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere or dissolved in plasma is a partial pressure, and in carbon dioxide, it's measured as PCO2. Say yes, CO2. Are you with me? Okay. All right, watch. I'm going to answer another question. Here it comes. Coming right at you. Ready? If somebody is bleeding their own blood, 
and it's spurtling out of them, and you're working in the emergency room, right? What's the best way to transport oxygen? No, to. What do you mean? What's the best way to transport oxygen? The blood. What kind of blood? Oxygenated blood. Say that really loud, Joe. Hemoglobin. Hemoglobin. Where's hemoglobin? In the blood. <laughs> I'm confused what this question is. I'm asking a good question, and I'm not backing down. I'm like a lawyer. Watch. What's in the blood? You got plasma and, and formed elements, right? So one of the things you got is a red blood cell. You learn this in general. This is a red blood cell. It is red, and it's big. You got me? You got this big freaking protein in there called, you better write this down, called hemoglobin. I stayed up all last night memorizing the shape. Looks exactly like that. You got me? Now watch. Hemoglobin is made up of two proteins. A heme portion and a globin. <laughs> the heme portion contains iron. Four iron atoms. Who's with me? And each iron atom is capable of carrying one molecule of oxygen. So how many molecules of oxygen can one hemoglobin molecule carry? That's very good because you did four times one, huh? Did you do that in your head? Are you with me? That's why blood is red. If you got a hoopty, right? You got some paint chip on it, there's iron in there. And when the oxygen hits the iron, it turns it red. That's why blood is red. If you are Vulcan, you don't have iron in your hemoglobin. You have copper. That's why his blood is green. You liked that one, didn't you, Erica? I have no idea what you're talking about. Good. That's why you liked it. Okay, now watch. This is the kicker. You better write this down. Better not pout. Each red blood cell doesn't have one molecule of hemoglobin. It has 250 million molecules of hemoglobin. So how much oxygen can one red blood cell carry? That times four, that's very good. That's a billion molecules of oxygen. Say yes. What do women do once a month? Besides complain and never good enough. <laughs> that's more than once a month. <laughs> Amen. No, you're going to get extra credit. Okay. What do they do? They have their menstrual cycle, right? So what do they bleed? Their own blood. You got me? And when you bleed your own blood, what are you losing? Iron. Iron. That's why a lot of women, when they're before they hit menopause, they get that iron deficiency anemia because of the heavy periods. Say, yeah. You're following me. And how do you feel if you don't have enough oxygen transported to your cells, Bella? Crabby. Crabby. Tired. Whiny. Yeah, yeah, real cranky. Get away from me. Don't touch me. I need my me time. <laughs> I like to call it house or chateau bawau. Chateau bawau. How many people got that? <coughs> Who, who's with me? What's the best way to transport oxygen in your blood? Bound to the iron on hemoglobin. Say yes. What's another way to transport oxygen? Dissolved in the plasma. How is that measured? PO2. Now watch O2. 
Again, every time I explain something, I explain to you why you need to know it clinically. Ready? Somebody comes in, they're bleeding their own blood. What's the best way to transport oxygen? You learned in general that there are different blood types, right? Can you look at somebody's blood? Is this spurtling? That's A negative all day. You can't do it, right? So it takes time to find out what the person's blood type is and then to get the donor blood and then to give it to the person. In the meantime, the person's dying. But you learned today in advanced AMP at Gateway Technical College that there's another way to transport oxygen in the blood. And how is that? Plasma. Dissolved in plasma. And we learned that plasma, well, most of us learned it, is what? 0.9% sodium chloride or normal saline. Say yes. So if somebody comes in and they're bleeding their own blood and you don't know their blood type, you get their blood, send it to the lab. In the meantime, you stop the bleeding. Yeah? <laughs> and then you start big IVs on them and give them a ton of saline. What is the percent oxygen in room air? Twenty-one percent. Do you want to let this poor sap breathe twenty-one percent oxygen? No. no. That's why you slap on a big mask, right? Or if they're going downhill, you intubate them and you give them a hundred percent oxygen because you want to maximize the amount of oxygen delivered in the plasma until you can start giving them the correct blood. Do you follow that? Yes. You got that? Okay. One more time. Can you breathe out all the air in your lungs? Okay, write this down. Again, this kind of defines some of the students I've had in my class in previous semesters. The amount of air left in your lungs that you can't breathe out is called your residual volume. Right? Residual volume. And it is basically anatomical dead space. Are you with me? Okay, here we go. Very few times I've asked you to learn numbers. You're going to have to learn numbers now. You got me? This will, well, I'm not even going to say it anymore. Do you see that screen the way it bounced? That was really cool. Maybe it just bounced on your screen or mine. Probably from the math. Ready? I'm going to label this. If you can tell me what Richard McLaughlin, the microbiology teacher, had for supper last night, I will give you extra credit. <laughs> you get three guesses. I'm waiting. Spaghetti. Very close. Lasagna. Even closer. Ravioli. That's right, ravioli. I'll give you uh, I'll give you 20 points of extra credit, everybody. Yeah. Isn't that nice? Yeah. yeah. I didn't think you'd get that. You went on the Italian theme and you just rolled with it. That's good. <laughs> it rhymed with. That's why I <laughs> thought of it. See, you should have thought of it. Ravioli, alveoli, ravioli. Here we go. Ready? Ready? Watch. Where does all venous blood get dumped into? Where does the right side of the heart pump the blood to? Is it oxygenated or deoxygenated? What's one of the ways that you transport oxygen in the blood? What's another way? PO2 dissolved in the plasma. You better write this down. The PO2 of venous blood in a resting metabolically inactive adult is 40 millimeters of mercury. This is the venous blood that's being pumped to the lungs to get oxygenated. 
I am spitballing again. But what do you think the PO2 of the alveoli is? Is it higher than 40 or lower? Amber's or April's lost. What's the PO2 in the alveoli? Is it higher or lower than 40? It has to be higher because where do you want the oxygen to go? From the alveoli into the plasma. You better write this down. The PO2 in the alveoli is 100 millimeters of mercury. One of the ways that oxygen or anything, blood moves in the body is by changes in pressure. Where's the pressure highest? Where is it lowest? In the pulmonary capillary. So by pressure, oxygen will move from the alveoli into the pulmonary capillary until the PO2 of the alveoli and the PO2 of the pulmonary capillary have equilibrated. <coughs> Good word. Do you follow that? Now I know what you're thinking. Because I thought it too many years ago when I was first learning this. I thought, is this class over yet? <laughs> <laughs> why wouldn't you take an average? Like, why is it a hundred and a hundred? Why wouldn't it be like, 75 and 75. Do you, do you know what I'm saying? No. Do you understand why it's 100? Yeah, because that's what you need to get through the heart to the cells. So no, but why is the PO2 here 100 and here 100? Because you want to go back Maybe I shouldn't even have to explain this if you got it. <laughs> Do, do you? <laughs> no, explain it. Explain it. You, gave the, you gave me the look. That's why I got up. Yeah. Do you understand? No, I'm serious. You had a look like. A, yeah. <laughs> you asked a question. I thought we were supposed to answer it. Right. No. But no, no. What I'm asking is. <laughs> watch. If you want. You, the PO2 here is 40. Yes. Yeah. You got me? The PO2 here is 100. You want those to be equal, yeah. right? So by pressure, oxygen is moving into the pulmonary capillary. So that PO2 should be dropping, shouldn't it? Shouldn't it? But isn't at the same time. What did you say? What did you say? You're still breathing. You're still breathing. Yeah. Watch. But you have 500 bucks in your bank account. Anybody that lucky? <laughs> Watch. If you have a bill that's $500 and you pay it, and as soon as you pay the bill, another 500 bucks comes in. That Has your so account nice. changed? Has your no. account balance changed? No. So. The reason the PO2 is 100 constantly is because you are constantly breathing and replenishing those alveoli with a PO2 of 100. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. Say yes, you saw that. There you have it. Please get this right. Where does all this newly oxygenated blood go? To the left side of the heart. And where does the left side of the heart send the blood to? All the, All the cells of the body. And where's the only place in the body that nutrients and gases are exchanged? No. You're just like a machine tonight. Maybe this is room. Maybe it's the air. Maybe there's a higher PO2 in this room or something. Watch. Watch it. Watch it. The PO2 inside a cell is 40 millimeters of mercury. What's the PO2 in the arterial end of the capillary? 100. That's exactly right. 
So in this picture, where is oxygen going to go and why? It is going to go from the arterial end of the capillary into the cell by pressure and sit at the end of the electron transport chain and say, yeah. What's the PO2 of venous blood? 40. <clears throat> Who's with me? Why is it 40? Because blood is continually circulating to that cell with a PO2 of 100. <laughs> huh? Say yes. Where do all the veins of the body dump their venous blood? Right side of the heart. Pumps that blood with a PO2 of 40. The alveoli, PO2 of a hot, bam. <laughs> Say yeah. Ready? I would love, you know what I'm, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to have you read. I'm not joking. I'm not joking. On Friday, when we come back, you're going to read the respiratory physiology chapter. That's what you're going to do. And I'm going to give you 10 multiple choice questions out of there. Why? I want you to realize and understand that I'm simplifying this stuff. I want you to read that chapter for me. Okay, I'm going to give you 10 questions. Watch. If you get a higher grade on that 10 question quiz than any of your other quizzes, which, you know, maybe for you it won't be that big a deal. If you do that, I'll give you that grade as a quiz. 10 questions, 10 multiple choice. Give you 10 minutes to answer the 10 questions. And if we vomit, it does not affect your grade. Doesn't affect your grade at all. Right? Doesn't affect your grade at all. Is that fair? They will be a challenge. They will. You don't have to take it. I don't care. You should take it. Because you don't want to read that chapter, do you? You don't have the book. Well, why don't you read it? You guys don't read it. Nobody reads the textbook. How many people read the textbook? One person. Yeah. I read it when I'm doing the quiz. Have you read the book, Joe? Not really. <laughs> the, pictures are the pictures are fantastic. You guys don't even look at the pictures. There's a cool thing in the middle that like breaks down the whole body. No, okay. I'm gonna tell you something. I just talked to a. Uh, do you see that? Did you see the screen move? Oh. Oh, maybe it's only doing it on my computer. Uh, I told you. I told you, but they got that flip classroom going. Told you about that. Yeah. Right? So this is what you do. Your class time, the teacher don't teach it, right? You look at and read the book, and then you come in and you discuss stuff. So guess how long class time is? It's two minutes, right? Because you have nothing to discuss because you haven't done any of the reading. I'm actually doing you a disservice. I need you to read that textbook, and you won't. You know why? You guys are haters, all of you. Here we go. What's the best way to transport oxygen? What's in the heme portion of hemoglobin? What does oxygen bind to? How many irons does each hemoglobin have? I'm only putting two because I'm tired. You got me? Watch. Now I'm going to put four. There's a reason I'm going to put four. What's the PO2 of arterial blood? Or uh, PO2 of the alveoli? What's the PO2 of venous blood? Boom. Watch. Where's the oxygen going to go by pressure? Until it equilibrates. Say yes. Watch it. As the, better write this down. 
as the PO2 increases in the plasma, that increases oxygen's affinity for binding to the iron on hemoglobin. Meaning, Meaning when the PO2 goes up, oxygen wants to bind to the iron on hemoglobin. Okay. Like more. more. And listen up because it's true. What's the saturation of this hemoglobin. What's it? Well, now it, it's not even hemoglobin anymore. It's 50%, right? How many oxygens are bound? How many can it hold? Okay, we're going to do some more math. What's the saturation? 75. You got me? Now watch. At a, a normal <laughs> Two. Hello? At a normal PO2, when the red blood cell comes in contact with the alveoli, in the pulmonary capillaries in the alveoli, the PO2 is 100. By the time all of those red blood cells leave the pulmonary circulation and go to the left side of the heart, 96 to 98 percent of every iron on every hemoglobin has an oxygen bound to it. Yes. Yes. So when you do the little fingy thing for a patient, mm -hmm. you are measuring the amount of oxygen bound to the iron on hemoglobin. Say yes. So you're measuring. I'm writing it out, O2 saturation of red blood cells. What's the best way to transport oxygen? Hemoglobin. hemoglobin. What's hemoglobin? Hemoglobin. It's a what? Protein. It's a protein. And we learned it. I'll never forget it. It was a Tuesday that proteins are temperature and pH sensitive. Didn't we learn that? I know we did. Watch, watch. What's the PO2 of arterial blood? What's the PO2 of venous blood? Better write this down, I'm not even playing. As the PO2 goes up in the plasma, what happens to oxygen's ability to bind to the iron on hemoglobin? It goes up. So oxygen increases its affinity for the iron on hemoglobin. Say yes. Oxygen wants to bind to the iron on hemoglobin in the lungs. Who got that? Why? Because the PO2 is going up. Where does all that venous blood go? And where does the right side of the heart? Did you just say? Okay. Yeah, I caught that one. I was going to be like the other day when I was agreeing with uh, Erica. And she was saying wrong stuff. <laughs> Remember that? Never forget that. That was definitely a Tuesday. Watch. Every semester, every freaking semester, right around this time, I get emails from students. Tim, can you help us with this? I'm like, no. And I see him in the hall, and I trip him. <laughs> I go, get out of my face. I'm busy. I'm working on my golf game. Did you see me out there hitting balls today? Yes. I was killing it. Joe, did you see that, man? Dude, I was smoking. Yeah. I hit that radio tower. There were sparks and everything. <laughs> I don't care. WGTC, man. It's off the air. <laughs> Courtesy of Timmy. I got a Titleist right up the epiglottis. All right, here we go. Ready? Watch. What's the saturation of a red blood cell in the arterial end of the capillary? Huh? 
Right, we're going to make it 100% because I'm not drawing like all those hemoglobins. You got me? What's the PO2 of arterial blood? No, it's not. Arterial blood, look, the A. 100. What's the PO2 inside a cell? Where's the oxygen going to go by pressure? Better write this down. Better not pout. As the PO2 begins to drop in the plasma, oxygen's ability to hold on to the iron on hemoglobin decreases. Oxygen dissociates from the iron on hemoglobin. It will unbind from the iron on hemoglobin, fall off, and where's it going to go? into the cell and sit at the freaking end of the electron transport chain and wait for a couple electrons. Say yeah. What's the PO2 of venous blood? Where's all the veins of the body dump their venous blood? Now watch. Watch. If you're going to understand the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve and all the implications that are associated with it, you need to understand one thing. All you need to do is think in your head, where do I want the oxygen to bind to the iron on hemoglobin, and where do I want it to let go? Do you understand that? Where do you want the oxygen to bind to the iron on hemoglobin? In the lungs. Where do you want it to let go? At the cell. So if you understand those conditions, you will understand the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Do you follow that? Yes or no? That's very good. Okay. Um, here, can we end it there? How many people want to do that quiz? Do you want to do the quiz? Yeah, the 10 questions? Sure. Why not, right? It can't hurt you. We were reading it in class or out of class? No, you're going to do it in class. I'm going to give you 10 minutes. So, so while you're, you're eating your cuties, you can do 10 questions. I'm reading. It's not going to hurt you. All I can do is help you. But if you didn't read the chapter, the respiratory chapter, right? So we're not we're going to do it not not Tuesday, Friday. Oh, it's a long time. And it won't count if you do worse than your Oh god. No. No, it'll count 110% of your grade. 10% of your microbiology grade. Have you taken microbiology yet? Summer. All right. I'm going to tell who's ever teaching it. Well, 10% of your grade's an F. Wow. It's the only